um, I'm not going to speak for very long. I'm just going to give a few comments about uh, about persecution. And I I spoke a few months ago at a meeting where some of you were present actually, and I won't name the man. There was a senator. Well, I will name him. It was Senator Don Meredith actually, and. Um, he, he walked out of the meeting anyway, so I can't offend him anymore. But he spoke at some length about persecution and, and failed to mention one very important word, and the word is Islam. He said, I'm not a priest, I'm not a minister, I'm not a politician, uh, and I'm really, really ugly, so I can say whatever I want. I don't have to be frightened of offending people. This is not about individual Muslims. Some of my closest friends, people like Tariq Fatar and Salim Mansour, like brothers to me. That's not the issue. Eshag Manji, for years I worked with their church. Again, she said, Kobe so close. It's not about individual Muslims. It is about Islam. And we have to ask some fundamental questions because putting aside the horror. Excuse me, just let me move this. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> the worrying thing is, it's ticking. <laughs> I'm not speaking to you, be quiet. Beyond the horrors that occur in Pakistan and in Saudi Arabia and in Iran and Egypt and the emerging Islamic Syria and contemporary Iraq, and well, let's just forget the individual countries, in every single nation where Islam forms a majority, you simply do not have, as we know it, rule of law, respect for minorities, embracing of opposition, free press, freedom of religion. And there is something which has to be noticed and declared and embraced. And that is the more Islamic a country becomes, the less religious freedom it evinces. We've seen this. We've seen this. Even, even in Iraq with that swine Saddam Hussein in power. And no sane person would ever support Saddam Hussein. But even there, as a secularist, as an opponent of fundamentalism, Christians were not directly targeted. President Assad and his father, again, these are not good people, not Saddam Hussein, I don't think they're sadistic as such, but they're dictators. But even under Assad, Christians in Syria enjoyed a freedom unparalleled anywhere else really in the Arab world. We see the emerging fundamentalism, we see the influence of the Muslim Brotherhood, and you know as well as I do, and it will get worse, and God forbid the Brotherhood take power in Syria, but I bet you they will. Christians are already leaving, and they will hemorrhage that country. Will the Jordanian regime stay? The monarchy in, in, in Jordan again is tolerant of Christians. Will it last? I doubt it. The Arab Spring, how's that going for you? The Arab Spring in Egypt? The Arab Spring in Egypt? Mubarak again, a dictator, but again, let's be realistic here, forget the nonsense and the saccharine. Mubarak wasn't a fascist, he was a pragmatic dictator. He didn't wish ill of his people, he wished well of his people, but if you got in the way, you'd be in trouble. I understand that. I prefer liberal democracy, but the alternative to these people is not liberal democracy, it is one person, one vote, one election. And we've seen that in Egypt, where the new government has pulled the wool over the eyes of Barack Obama, peace be upon him. <laughs> and will now impose, with the help of a wavering military and Islamic dictatorship. And that's when you really will see, please God, I'm wrong, but I think you will see the bloodshed when Coptic Christians, 12, 13, 14 percent of the population perhaps, will have to fight for their rights to survive or leave that country. And thank the living God we have a government, a conservative government, that is empathetic to Christianity and Christian suffering. And I think will, if it has to, open the doors to Christian refugees from Egypt. I pray, I pray that won't happen because the idea of a Middle East without Christianity is grotesque, it's horrendous, it's hideous, but their safety comes first. Their safety comes first. So we do have to ask fundamental questions about Islam. We have to ask the most fundamental of all, which is, are the moderate Muslims, are the tolerant Muslims, are the pluralistic Muslims, the real Muslims, or are they the ones who have got it wrong? And there are many who will argue today that authentic Islam cannot be moderate and pluralistic, because its very nature, its very essence, is 
imposition of one religion on everybody. Yes, you can be a dhimmi. Yes, you can be a Christian or a Jew. And you'll pay a tax and you'll be humiliated and you'll be a second class citizen. Well, that's not equality. Has there been a time in history where Islam has really coexisted with other religions and always told about the, the, the great period in Iberia when Judaism, Christianity and Islam coexisted? Well, yeah. But the point there, don't believe what you hear on CBC and PBS for goodness sake. The point there is it didn't last very long. It stands out not because it was the norm, but because it was so eccentric and unusual. This is why Islamic armies got to the gates of Vienna. As last time I looked, Austria was not Muslim. It's not a Muslim place to be. Islamic armies, the gates of Vienna. Why do you think Bosnia is Muslim? Because the, the people of the region, Slavs, said, oh, hey, let's be Muslim. No, they were invaded by the Turks. The Armenian Genocide. More than a million people, almost two million people slaughtered by, by Turkish Muslims. And Turkey, which, which has more journalists in prison than any other country on the face of the earth, but tells Israel what to do in terms of freedom and democracy. Good Lord. Turkey still is in effect a Holocaust-denying state. Turkey refuses to admit to the attempted genocide of the Armenian Christian people. And it then tells other countries how to behave morally and ethically. Turkey is in control and occupation of half of Cyprus. Kurdistan is occupied by four different Islamic powers. I always find it rather amusing that people talk about the Israeli occupation. They're not in Gaza. Have a look at the place. There are no Jews in Gaza. It's Juden Frey. They're not in the West Bank either. But if you really want occupation, look at the occupation of Kurdistan. Let's go further. The heartland, the homeland of Christianity, the Middle East, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, North Africa, Israel, Palestine, the church fathers, the early popes, the first Christians. Egypt was a majority Christian country. Egypt was a majority Christian country. It had a Jewish and a pagan minority. When Arabic Islamic armies from a long way away rode in and conquered, do we really think that every Christian in Egypt said, oh, I want to be a Muslim, I want to... No, they didn't. They were forcibly converted. And when we say this, we're accused of intolerance. When we state and speak the truth about the history of a great world religion, Islam, we're accused of intolerance. No, we're merely speaking the truth. Once again, this is in no way to criticize or condemn individual Muslims. The vast majority, even the blasphemy law in Pakistan, the majority of people imprisoned under the blasphemy law are not Christians, they are Muslim. The people who suffer most under Islam are Muslims. This is not a war for Christians. This is not a battle for Christians. It's not a campaign for Christians. It's a war, a battle, a campaign for equality and decency and humanity for all people, irrespective of race and religion and gender and sexuality, all people to be free. I've never understood the left in this country and in the United States and in Europe that has this obsession, this fetish, about supporting radical Islam. The first people to suffer under Islam after Christians will be the left, homosexuals, and feminists. The very people who make up these groups who keep on forming alliances with radical Muslims on the streets of Toronto, New York, and Washington. It is, as they say, a funny old world, isn't it? And when we look at the Islamic diaspora, what do we see? I cover the demonstrations for Sun News that occur in Toronto every time someone, an Islamic group, is calling for something or other, killing a man who makes a film about Muhammad, in the name of peace and love, we must cut this man's head off, that sort of thing. And I, I always go there and I cover the demonstrations. And last time it was, um, it was about 500 mainly Shia Muslims uh, from, from South Asia, and they were demonstrating opposite the American consulate. And they were demanding that the man who made that ridiculous movie, it was only a 30-minute movie about Muhammad, be executed. And, and I said to them, well, he, I think the movie was crass. I think it was insulting, but he has a right to make the movie. And they said, no, no, he doesn't. They said, if you said that about Christianity, you'd be put in prison. And I said, well, can you give an example where someone has been put in prison in Canada for saying something offensive about Christianity? And then they just started shouting at me. 
But it's interesting because the mentality they have is they simply assume that is the case because that is the case in every Muslim country. The blasphemy law isn't really about blasphemy, it's about control and oppression. And there are many followers of Islam who want to apply and introduce blasphemy laws to this country. My friend and colleague, my dear friend and colleague Ezra Levant was charged with blasphemy, as was Mark Stein. Ezra Levant, and you may know this story, went on a radio show with an imam in Calvary, and they argued about religion. And Ezra, being the in incredibly non-controversial, gentle person he is, yeah, it was funny. Ezra spoke his mind, not rudely, but with conviction. And the imam, do oh, you remember, it's a radio show, talk radio, you know, you give, the imam went to the police station in Calgary, the police station, and said, I want this man arrested. And the police said, uh, we don't do that in Canada. He should have added, yet. We don't do that in Canada. So he then went to the, on the, the Alberta Human Rights Commission, and a piece of paper, not even as neat as this. He wrote his complaint on the back. He just wrote it out, took it to the Alberta Human Rights Commission, and they said, okay, we'll deal with that. And they charged Ezra with blasphemy. They charged him with blasphemy. They didn't call it that, but he was charged with offending, saying hateful things about Islam on the public airwaves. He said nothing hateful at all. He merely stated the truth. Mark Stein. Thank the Lord we have people like Mark Stein and Ezra Levant. Mark Stein wrote a piece about Islam that was serialized in Maclean's magazine. It was factual. It was about population. It was about population in Europe and how Muslim minority groups are growing larger and larger. And when they reach a certain percentage in society, they become rather aggressive in imposing their point of view. There was an attack. Maclean's magazine was taken to the Human Rights Commission. The people who complained demanded a 3,000-word article, unedited, be placed in the magazine. The editor of the magazine, to his great credit, said, I'll close this thing down before you're allowed to do that. It went to a Human Rights Commission. Again, it was a blasphemy law attack. It was only because people like Mark and Ezra have so much gumption and so, much con so many connections in media, because once media shines a light on these people, uh, forgive the analogy, but it's rather like the rock being lifted and the cockroaches run around. Because when they can get away with it, they will hurt people. But suddenly the light comes on, the darkness is expunged, and they can no longer get away with it. The cartoon, Kurt Vestergaard, Danish cartoonist, I've interviewed him several times now. I'm proud to say I have a copy of his cartoon of Muhammad, framed, signed, hanging on my office study. If you know where I live, come and get me. This man has mocked Christianity for years. He's an anarchist. He's not a Christian. He's an anarchist. He's made fun of Christianity for decades. Nothing has ever happened to him. Let me briefly give you the context of what happened in Denmark. Denmark prides itself on tolerance and freedom and liberalism. Two incidents occurred. An academic at a university in Copenhagen read the Quran with respect. He wasn't being critical of it. But as a non-Muslim, he read the Quran to a group of non-Muslims in his class. He was kidnapped, beaten almost to death. Shortly after this, a biography for children of Muhammad was written, again, very respectful, reverential. They couldn't find anyone with the courage to draw illustrations for the book. So a day, the largest Danish newspaper said, are we still a truly tolerant and free society? And they asked for people to draw cartoons of Muhammad. They weren't particularly offensive, for goodness sake. Nothing like the way Christians and Jews are routinely portrayed in the Islamic press and the Arab press. And quite a while after this, when the cartoons are printed in the newspaper, for political advantage, a fatwa was issued on Kurt Vestergaard, and the man has had to live in virtual hiding ever since. Dozens of people have been murdered because of it. On Christmas, about two years ago, his house was invaded. He was there with his granddaughter. He managed to flee into the safe room, the secure room. Otherwise, he would have been killed. The police found an axe and a dagger outside. This happens all over Europe. In Malmo, what, the third largest city in Sweden, the Jewish community has virtually all gone now. They can't walk the streets anymore. Anti-Semitic hate crimes in, in parts of England, London and Manchester have gone up enormously in the past 10, 15 years. It's not white skinheads, believe me. The names are all the same of the people who commit the attacks. I'll say again, it's not about individual Muslims. It is about Islam. We have to have the courage 
perhaps the Christian courage, to ask the question, what does the Quran say? What does Sharia teach? Is this a book? Is this a book that asks of its followers love and understanding? Does it include the golden rule of forgiveness? Hinduism does, Buddhism does, Judaism does. Does Islam? Does Islam? Does Islam lionize as we do the notion of coexistence and pluralism and turning the other cheek? and respecting, tolerating, even loving those who are critical of you. Does it really say that? No. These questions are too intimidating for mainstream media. They're too intimidating for many, if not most, politicians. But the people who know the answer better than anyone else are the Christians of Egypt and Iraq and Syria and Pakistan. They know it on a daily basis. Basis. And I'll end with this, and I'm not here to talk to you about Pakistan, but when Jinnah envisaged a, a majority Muslim state, it was based on a very non-Islamic idea, and it was the idea of coexistence, of all religions being treated with respect. As soon as Islamic fundamentalism, or maybe we should call it by its real name, as soon as Orthodox Islam came into play and then won the day, everything changed. When Christian schoolgirls on the way to school in the morning in Indonesia are beheaded by an Islamic gang, when Sunni Muslims blow themselves up in Shia areas killing other Muslims because they disagree with them, when Islamic fundamentalist terrorists in Israel target old people and children to kill, we have to have the courage to ask the question, are all religions the same? And if you say they are, you're either ignorant or you're a liar. Yeah. We hear this, we hear this over and over again. I was watching George Strombolopoulos. I mean, I've known George for years. He's a good guy in many ways, but George, for goodness sake, it is sickening sometimes. Watch, I don't watch anyone, but watching you fawn over people. He was talking to Salman Rushdie, it was, it was just a couple of nights ago. Here is Salman Rushdie, who knows a thing or two about speaking out about Islam. And George Strombolopoulos, you know, $400,000 a year of your money, so don't you laugh. He says, yeah, well, of course, there's extremism in all religions. Yeah, yeah, there is actually, George, there is extremism in all religions. But the next time a Southern Baptist tries to cut your head off, Tell me about it. The next time an Orthodox Jew tries to blow up your family, tell me about it. Until then, with all due respect, shut up! Yeah. I came to this country 26 years ago, and it is a great, great country. It is founded on Christian values and Christian virtues, as are almost all the great countries. We mustn't take those for granted. We must not take those for granted. Whether it's here or Australia, the United States, the UK, Southern Europe, Northern Europe, I'm not claiming these are Christian countries as such anymore, but their foundation, the very basis of their culture and freedom is Christianity. And we have a culture now in a society that is so eager to kick and bash Christianity it doesn't realize it's kicking away the very supports, the very legs of that table that give it the right to be so angry at what mom and dad and grandma and grandpa achieved and built. When you create a vacuum, when you destroy, in this case, Christianity, that vacuum will not be filled by secular liberalism, believe me. It won't be filled by woolly atheism, believe me. It will be filled by something as dynamic as Christianity, as organized and as faithful and religious as it will be Islam. It's time to take sides. Yes, we have to love, yes, we have to forgive, but in addition to forgiveness and love and compassion, there is resolution and strength and there is rejoicing in truth. Unless we do that, unless and until we do that, we're in deep, deep.
Thank you and God bless you. We have to really think about it now. Uh, you said about not coming to the Pakistani and the evangelicals. Yeah. Well, Mike, uh, Michael, we have a, a special suite for the same purpose to sweeten you up a little bit. Okay? <laughs> yeah, it's, and, and this one is, there's no sugar in it, right? Okay. It's a, it's a Pakistani sweet, and I hope you'll I just have to say, my, my, my wife is Goa, and when, and, when, and when South Asians say there's no sugar in it, I know you're lying. <laughs> a small token from uh, all of us from here, and uh, another... Uh, and, uh, Thank <laughs> you.